Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Haya Kadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. And Jesus, the Redeemer of our souls, is King of kings and Lord of lords. He who has washed us in his precious and mighty blood, he is King of kings and Lord of lords. And together, God's people say, Hallelujah. Well, friends, today we are continuing our study in Matthew on the Red Letter series, and we find ourselves in chapter 16. Now, last time we were together, Peter had just made the confession among the 12 disciples and Jesus that Jesus is the Christ. We see that in Matthew 16, 16. He is the son of the living God. And so Jesus says, Peter, flesh and blood did not reveal this unto you. This was revealed unto you by God the Father, by the Almighty, by the Ancient One. He has opened your eyes and you've seen truth that very few have seen before. And so after that, in verse 21, it says, from that time... From the moment of that confession that Peter had made, recognizing that Jesus is the promised one, he is the one who was spoken about all the way through the Old Testament and whom the Jews have been waiting on for a very long time. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders, these are the Jewish leaders, the chief priests, again, Jewish leaders, and scribes, and he must be killed and be raised again the third day. Now, although it may have shocked many of the followers of Jesus, Jesus was not shocked by this, and we're going to learn more about this in a few moments. But Jesus knew that he was born to be killed, and that's what he says. He says, it is my time. I must go into Jerusalem, and there the religious leaders of Israel will have me killed, but don't fret, because on the third day, I will raise again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, verse 22, then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But Jesus turned and said unto Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. Now, when he says that word Satan, he's saying adversary, but he uses the same word that our adversary, the adversary of our souls, the same word that is used for him, the prince of darkness, he who plagues us each and every day. And so he calls Peter an adversary. He says, get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest, or thou regardest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. You would have me stay here. You would have me live in peace. You would have me heal the sick, raise the dead, bring salvation to the Jews. But that's not God's plan. And so rather than have me, encourage me to do what men would have me to do, you should be encouraging me to do the things that God has had me to do. And if you were as familiar with your Old Testament scriptures as you think you are, you would know the same things that I know. You would know that I came to die. Well, how do we know that? First of all, let's look at uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of who I am chief. So Jesus came into the world to save sinners. How is he going to save sinners? He must be crucified. He must shed his blood. That goes all the way back to the time of Moses when blood had to be shed for the forgiveness of sins. Blood from a lamb, and that's why Jesus is called the Lamb of God. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 9. Who hath saved us, speaking of Jesus, and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus 
before the world began. Look at Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8. All that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So what we must understand is even before Adam and Eve were created, much less before they fell, God already had a plan in work that Jesus would come and save men from their sins. So in creating Adam, he knew even as he breathed life into him that Adam would rebel against him, fall into sin and disobedience, and will fall out of relationship with God. And Jesus, the promised one, the son of God, must come in order to purchase men back into a right and proper relationship with him. So back to Matthew for a moment. Matthew chapter 16, again, verse 23. Peter had taken him, rebuked him, and said, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. We will not allow you to go to Jerusalem and be killed. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. So Jesus knew that he must die. And he knew this from a very little boy. Why? Because we know Mary knew as well. Turn to Luke chapter 2, and let's look at verse 25. Now, before we read verse 25, in verse 21 it says, When eight days were accomplished, so Jesus has been alive for eight days, once these eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days of her purification, Mary's purification according to the law of Moses were accomplished, they brought Jesus to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons, depending on how financially stable you were, what you could afford. Verse 25, Behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation or the comfort of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he has seen the Lord's promised one, or the Lord's Christ. When I look at verse 34, Simeon comes upon Mary and Joseph, and he blesses them. And he says unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. So Simeon is basically telling Mary that Jesus is going to live a rejected, lonely, and despised life from the day he's able to walk until the day that he dies. Now look at verse 35. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thine own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. So Simeon is telling Mary your soul is going to be pierced with agony and misery beyond anything that you can even possibly begin to imagine. Now look at verse 51. And he went down with them, speaking of Jesus, he came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. Jesus is 12 years old here. He's just left the temple scene where he got lost from his parents, or so they thought. He's in the temple learning and teaching they find him in the temple, and it says, Jesus went down with his parents. They came to Nazareth, and Jesus was subject to his parents, but his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. What sayings? The sayings that Simeon had told her. This child is set for the fall and the rising again of many in Israel, for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thine own soul also. And so Mary, most likely not being able to understand exactly what it is Simeon has told her, is pondering these things in her heart. And as a committed Jew, Mary is familiar with the writings of the old text. So let's see what they have to say about Jesus. 
Look at Psalm chapter 69, and let's look at verses 8 through 12. Now, as we read this, picture this talking about Jesus. Verse 8, I am become a stranger unto my brethren. So if this is a prophecy about Jesus, it says that he's rejected even by his own blood brothers. And most likely it was because he wasn't a son of Joseph. So he was ostracized by the others, considering him an illegitimate child. I mean, we must remember that even Joseph was going to put her away privately because he knew the accusations that would be said about her, that she was a whore, that she had been sexually promiscuous before she and Joseph had consummated the marriage. And so back to Psalm chapter 69. I am become a stranger unto my brethren and an alien unto my mother's children. For the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up, and the reproaches of them that reproach thee are fallen upon me. When I wept and chastened my soul with fasting, that was to my reproach. I made sackcloth, also my garment, and I became a proverb to them. Now notice what it says here. Jesus has become a proverb, a saying among the people of the village. And in verse 12, they that sit in the gate speak against me, and I was the song of the drunkards. So Jesus was viciously mocked and despised even as a growing boy because of the so-called reputation of his mother. And it wasn't just by the people of his town it was within his very family. Even his brothers mocked him, rejected him, and would not accept him as a legitimate child of Mary. Now keep in mind here, the context of what we're speaking about is from our text. Matthew chapter 16, specifically verse 23, the latter part. Jesus says unto Peter, you do not savor or regard the things that be of God, but those that be of men. So Jesus is very aware of the plan of God in his life. And just as Mary and others are familiar with these old texts, these prophecies that have been written about the Messiah, the promised one, it seems everyone wants to gravitate and cling to the promises that are most positive. But look at what Isaiah chapter 49 verse 16 says. It says, I've graven thee, Upon the palm of my hands, look at chapter 50, verse 6. I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. Look at what Isaiah chapter 53, verses 1 through 12 say. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He doth not have no form nor comeliness. So he wasn't a very attractive man. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men. He is a man of sorrows, and he is acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. You see, so often we think of Jesus as being despised and rejected in the three years of his ministry. But friends, he was despised, rejected, alone, his entire life. He wasn't the popular one. He wasn't the life of the party. He was invisible to most people. They acted like he wasn't even there. Surely he hath borne our griefs, and he has carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. 
yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he's poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Now friends, there's not one positive thing about the life of Jesus contained within the scriptures that we've just taken a look at. It's the absolute opposite. He is despised. He is rejected. He is unattractive. There's nothing about him that draws men to him. Now, of course, we're talking about his physical presence. Even his reputation among men was destroyed before he was ever born. And so if you have a picture on your wall of Jesus with long flowing hair, very attractive, ready for the cover of a GQ magazine, you might as well take it down and throw it away, friends, because that's not what he looked like. Not even close. There was nothing attractive, no beauty within him. And unlike most boys and girls who have aspirations of what they're going to be when they grow up, he knew that he came to die. Intellectually, he was very familiar with the old texts. And as he read these texts, he knew that they spoke of him. So some 2,000 years ago, this young boy Jesus reads these writings in Isaiah chapter 53, what we just read, and he knows as he's reading this, it's, it's talking about his life. He knew when he was going to die, and he knew how he was going to die. And friends, it was nothing to look forward to. I'm not going to say that he regretted the day, but I can certainly say it caused him much pain physically in the flesh to contemplate the day because he knew what suffering was going to be entailed, not just on his behalf, but for his followers and for his mother. They were going to be present as he was being crucified. And so as any loving son would be, as any loving friend would be, his heart was pained because their heart was pained. He wept because they wept. His heart was broken because their heart was broken. And yet, what does he say so often? Not my will, but thy will be done. This is why I came, and I'm not going to allow anything to prevent or even attempt to prevent me from it. And that's what he's saying to Peter in our text. And yet, even though he tells them in verse 21... I must go to Jerusalem, I must suffer many things, I will be killed, but I will be raised again the third day, they do not understand what it is that he's saying, even up to the point of his death. They don't understand what he has told them. Their eyes are blind, and yet after he died, many of the things that he had told them now comes rushing back to them, and all of a sudden it makes sense. You see, they didn't see the passages that we've just discussed pointing to Jesus, pointing to the promised one until he was already gone. But now when they read passages like Isaiah chapter 49, verse 16, which says, I've graven thee upon the palm of my hands. Oh, I get it. It makes sense. And so friends, don't ever allow yourself to think that he was caught by surprise. 
Don't ever allow yourself to think that Calvary was a tragedy. It is the most victorious event in human history. And even before the first man was created, God the Father had already ordained his son to die on an old wooden cross for you and me. So let's stand with this thought, friends. If you've ever felt rejected, if you've ever felt alone, if you've ever felt despised, mocked, abused, if you've ever felt like you're not the life of the party, that no one wants to be your friend, you share in much of what Jesus experienced in his life. And that, in some small way, should bring you much comfort. Because if that is true about you, then you are in good company, friends. I trust that you've been blessed today, friends, and I pray the word of God has spoken to you in a new and fresh way. Now, as he wills, and until next time, friends, I love you, and I'll see you on the next video.